So hi, everyone. Thank you once again for being at this community chat out of Montefiore Nyack Hospital. My name is Sandra Arevalo, and I'm the Director of Community Health and Education. I'm happy to have today Stacy Taylor from uh, Sunny Rockland, who's going to be talking today about occupational therapy, what it is, and if one of you or many more of you out there doesn't really know about occupational therapy, we're going to learn about how to even become professional in occupational therapy and how important this is to help others. So if you have that call that you want to be helping other people and you don't know what to do because being a doctor or a nurse might not be for you, then maybe occupational therapy might be your response. We'll find out today. Uh, Stacy, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for reaching out to us. And I'm very happy that you're using this channel to talk to our community about what is occupational therapy. But first of all, I would like to ask you, you know, what your profession is, how you got into this, and maybe, you know, give us the opportunity to get to know you a little better. Absolutely. I just want to first of all say welcome, everyone. Good afternoon on this, I would, would say, beautiful Thursday, but it started off a little rainy. Um, but thank you for having me, Sandra. I really appreciate this opportunity. So I'm coming to you, actually. Um, I'm a certified occupational therapy assistant, and I'm actually at SUNY Rockland Community College right now. And I came to this profession, just to give you a little bit of background about me, kind of backwards, which is what a lot of our students seem to come to um, occupational therapy. Not everybody knows what it is. And I find that people learn about occupational therapy when they either have a child or a parent or a sibling or a loved one um, that has gotten some type of rehabilitation due to an injury or a disorder or a disease. And they um, then learn all about occupational therapy. So my particular background, what happened with me was I um, have a bachelor's degree already in psychology, and I went into human resources. I was a recruiter for many years in corporate America in Manhattan for many companies, Viacom, MTV, VH1, all that. I loved my world of recruitment and human resources. And then life happens and life changes. And I wound up, um, after I got married, I had two children, and one of my children was classified for uh, low muscle tone at four years old. And the nursery school teacher came to me and said, I really think you should look to this, uh, look to the school district to see if your child would be classified for occupational therapy. And I had no idea what she was talking about. So I said, I don't even know what occupational therapy is. I have, I have a four year old, I, I don't know what you're talking about. And she said, well, I know he's only four, but he really um, needs to open up his um, juice boxes stronger. He needs to put the straw in the juice bag better. You know, so let's see what occupational therapy can do for him. And I said, sure. So I sat down with the occupational therapist that he was assigned to. And I sat and I really watched everything this practitioner was doing with him with all the strengthening, all the um, therapeutic, all the therapeutic skills, all of the throw the ball in the bucket and eye hand coordination and all these things and the pencil grippers and drawing mazes in the lines. And I said, this is really working. He's doing so much better in nursery school. It really is unbelievable. And she said to me, you know what? You're such an involved parent and so interested in this and so compassionate. This is the type of person that would make a great um, occupational therapy practitioner. Go to Rockland Community College, and which I'll talk to you about. Um, go to Rockland Community College, and it's a two and a half year program, and you will come out and be able to treat other children like your own and share all of the knowledge that you've learned. So this is a second career for me. Um, I absolutely love it. I went to Rockland Community College for their OTA program. And at the time I had a first grader and a fourth grader. So being a busy mom and my husband was busy himself. He, um, as a matter of fact, works with Nyack Hospital in a, in a different capacity. So he was very busy as well. And I said, I'm just going to do this. I have a goal. And at the end of the two and a half years, I was a working certified occupational therapy assistant. I worked in pediatrics for a while um, in a sensory pediatric outpatient gym. And I'll go through my presentation and I'll show you what I'm talking about, the flexibility with OT. 
Um, after that, I worked at one of the Rockland County school districts. I was involved with six different schools I, from K through 12, going back and forth. I was, at times I felt a little bit like Mary Poppins with all of my manipulatives and toys in my car, going to kindergarten and helping them learn how to hold a crayon and then running right to the high school and helping them to type faster for kids who maybe had attention deficit disorder or autism or some type of sensory integration disorder. Um, so I was, it was definitely a variety of things that were going on during the day. And I loved that job. After that, um, RCC came to me and said, you know what you, between your recruiting background and knowing about occupational therapy and having work in the field, we would love for you to go out and become our OTA outreach coordinator. So, um, similar to Sandra, what you're doing with community outreach and education, that's what I'm doing now for Rockland Community College, spreading my knowledge and my experience of occupational therapy. So I go and I talk to the various libraries, the high schools, and I share um, all about occupational therapy and how wonderful it is. So um, that's part of that. That's my background. It's, it's, you know, it's kind of varied. It's not the traditional way. I didn't come straight out of high school and go into OT. But um, you know, I, I I've seen it firsthand, and I love what I do, and I have a lot of experience in different areas in it. So that's that's what I do. Well, thank you so much, Stacy, for sharing that. It's really um, a very nice, inspiring, and personal story to follow. And you know, I don't know if you realize that when you talk, you're sending us some pearls right there. So how long did you say that it takes to become an certified in occupational therapy? Okay, so our program at RCC is about five semesters. So it's about two and a half years. The program, and again, in my presentation, I'll go through it more specifically, but our program, we allow you to do the whole program up until eight semesters. So you have that time because we understand life happens and not everybody can do it at you know uh, a speed that maybe they want to or they would like to at that moment, you know, people have babies, pe people's jobs change, we have part time jobs that change and whatnot. So generally our students finish in about five semesters, you have four semesters of courses, and then you have one semester again I'll go through this more specifically, but you have one semester where it's field work and you're assigned to um, eight weeks at a pediatric site it could be a school or a sensory gym. And then you have eight weeks internship at a skilled nursing facility or a geriatric or assisted living um, type rehab situation. After you do those 16 weeks of internship, you are fully prepared, really prepared. RCC gets you 100% prepared for taking the national exam. And we have 100% pass rate for all of our graduates. So our professors know what they're talking about. It's a rigorous program, not gonna lie. It's not a walk in the park. You really have to be motivated. Um, and I'll talk about what different attributes make a great occupational therapy practitioner. Once you get through the program, you will pass because the professors are working in their field or have worked for many years in um, mental health OT, pediatric OT, geriatric OT, um, physical rehab OT, physical dysfunction OT. So they're not just academic book reader you know, teachers, they're in the field and teach you how to transfer a patient from a wheelchair to a toilet or from a bed to standing you really know, get that knowledge. And, and you know what I'm thinking right now, Stacey? Um, I think these are skills that not only professionals need, but just, for example, if you're going to take care of a loved one that is sick or something, these are the skills that you really should learn. So even if you didn't become certified, you know, it's something that you really would like to pursue just to be able to help others around you. But anyway, that's my right. idea. <laughs> right, no, and you're absolutely right. So even if you decide not to become an occupational therapy assistant or an occupational therapist, I want to educate people on what, let, let's start from the beginning. When, and this is what I tell when I go out to the high schools and to the libraries, when people hear the word occupation, the first word in your mind when you think occupation is a job right? You think occupation, oh, right. job, employment, things like that. And so people get confused saying, I mean, I can't tell you how many people come to me and say occupational therapy. I don't need help finding a job. And so I want to destroy that misnomer of it has nothing to do with finding a job specifically. Right. Okay. Occupational therapy, let's break it down smaller. Occupation is how do you occupy your time? How do you occupy 
not occupational job. How do you occupy your time? So right now I'm occupying my time by communicating and presenting, right? I'm occupying my time. I'm holding my, I'm hoping everybody can see me. I'm holding my pen and I'm pretending to write notes, okay? I, I'm occupying my time by sitting in a chair on my own, on my, in my own will. And I also occupied my time by getting dressed on my own independently. Okay, so obviously many, many ways that you occupy your time. What happens if there is, you encounter a disease, um, you know, multiple sclerosis or diabetes or a disorder, um, or if you're born with Down syndrome, or if you have a stroke, or if, um, you know, for all intents and purposes, I mean, obviously I, I wanna go through all of these things that are medical, but God forbid you wind up with cancer, or you have some type of an accident, anything that can happen across the lifespan or even developmental where there's an uh, intellectual deficit, uh, developmental delay going on, autism, ADHD, anything. What do you do if you want to also occupy your time with things that you want to do? We all have separate journeys. We all have separate likes and dislikes. We all are very unique. So while I, I actually, personally, I play the flute, I've always played the flute. I love playing the flute. Well, what if I hurt my shoulder and I can't lift up my shoulder to now hold my flute? I would might I might see an occupational therapist and I would sit down with them and say, I want to be able to continue to be the musician that I was. And so the OT, with abbreviation for occupational therapy, the OT would come to me and say, well, let's figure out how I can help you help yourself to hold that flute better. So OT is not, we are not AIDS. I am not doing it for you. I am not your um, assistant helping you. I am teaching you as the patient or the student or the client, despite your injury or disease or disorder or illness, I'm teaching you how to do it better yourself and get more independent despite the condition you're dealing with, okay? With anything you want to occupy your time with, whether it's getting ready for bed and putting on your pajamas, remembering where your glasses are, um, remembering the route that you're going to when you drive every day, if you have, you're diagnosed now with dementia, could be anything. Okay, so that's where OT comes in. So yes, you don't necessarily have to become certified in occupational therapy, but it is great to know what it is about and helping other people be as independent as they can. Okay. Yeah, that definitely sounds amazing. And I'm, I'm going to get you away with the with the presentation, because I could talk for you, with oh, you okay. forever. I already we'll, 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 go, we'll go through it. And, and if you have any questions, please, please let me know. Yes. And also to our audience, you know, if you have any questions, please just start uh, writing them down in the chat, the Q&A. I'll be happy to ask uh, to stay to your questions. Okay. So here we have, we'll get into some therapy facts. So the American Occupational Therapy Association, AOTA, um, which is our governing accreditation organization uh, nationally. So their definition of occupational therapy, I have it here. Um, occupational therapy is the only profession that helps people across their lifespan to do the things they want and need to do through the therapeutic use of daily activities. So where I was talking about before, people across the lifespan, we are trained as OTs from birth through um, end of life. We are well um, experienced in all medical conditions, developmental conditions. I am not a nurse. I am not a doctor. I am not a psychologist, but I'm there to help that client get through whatever stage of life they're in, um, age chronologically, and also psychologically and whatever medical issue. And I kind of put it all together and help them get through what they want and need to do. Okay. The employment of occupational therapy assistance is growing by leaps and bounds. And it's a very high in-demand occupation. And according to the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, the profession will grow 25% between now and 2031. So it's a great profession to get into if you're thinking of a helping profession. And as I said, an OTA career is two and a half years. You wind up with an Associates of Applied Science in Occupational Therapy Assistant and you can work right away after that, um, literally right away. I'm getting still emails all the time from different uh, nursing homes and schools saying, please come and help us out and work with us. So it's really in high demand. Um, which brings me to my next piece. OTAs are welcomed by public schools. Um, I recently worked at the Pearl River School District. I've worked in the Clarkstown School District. Rehabilitation hospitals, um, such as Helen Hayes or Sunrise Nursing Home, Sunrise Assisted Living, um, Pine Valley, 
They hire occupational therapy assistance, mental health centers. I know there's at Rockland Psychiatric Center, there's other areas, outpatients, nursing homes, physician practices, and home health. And there's many others that are I'll, I'll list later in the presentation. The average salary for an occupational therapy assistant in New York is projected to be about $65,000 a year. So with just an associate's degree of two and a half years of study to walk into, a, into a, an employment where you can, especially if you go to a community college like ours, um, you know, it's, it, the value is wonderful for a program. It's about twelve dollars to $13,000 for the entire program from beginning to license. Um, and then you can go out and be about $65,000 a year. So that's something definitely to keep in mind. So what do OTAs do? So short of what I've already been discussing, um, if you can see the picture on the right side here, these are two of our students currently in our occupational therapy lab, which we have here on campus. It is a simulated apartment. We have a working kitchen. We have a um, bathtub. We have a toilet. We have a bed. Uh, we have desks, chairs, uh, vanity, sink, a whole area to teach our students how to help their patients and their clients to be at home safely. So again, if you look at this picture, um, our student Michonne in the blue and the scrubs uh, uniform is helping our other patient, um, pretend patient, she's a student, her name is Emily, and she's showing what it would be like if she was in Emily's home helping her with the walker and also pour her own cup of coffee and make her coffee from the coffee pot because that's what Emily wants to do. So she's making sure she's steady there. So we work with people of all ages in various settings. We help to improve their ability to participate in their daily activities. That's what we call occupations. So it's not just a job. It can be a job because part of the way we spend our time is in a job, but your occupations are how you occupy your time. We focus what is on meaningful and valuable to a patient. So what, let's say Emily likes, and in this picture, she's wearing the red sweatshirt. Let's say she's my patient. She may like something completely differently from what I like. Maybe I don't even like to do what she likes to do. Maybe she likes to collect seashells and I have no interest in that. My job as an occupational therapy assistant is to help her collect those seashells because she wants to as independently as she can, despite her illness or her injury. So you can choose a specialty or change specialties to meet career needs. So I know plenty of occupational therapy practitioners who work in a school district during the day from eight to three, but then they also come to RCC and they are adjunct professors and they train students, or they work on the weekends at a nursing home or they do home health care. So it's really one of the only professions that I know of where you can work in many different settings in the same day. Okay, you don't just have to say, well, I don't want to work in schools, so I don't want to be an OT, or I don't want to work in a hospital because I don't like to be around um, sick patients. You can do everything and you can flip it around. So it's very flexible. You work under the supervision of an occupational therapist. That's called an OTR, a registered occupational therapist. Okay, so as an OTA, your two and a half years of training, you are always supervised by an OTR not always directly eyesight, but they will always sign off on your progress notes or your documentation, and you will always collaborate with them. And um, they will evaluate and assess and make sure that you are um, competent in the area when you're dealing with a client. And then you become a licensed healthcare provider. You're in the health sciences. So you are a licensed healthcare provider in the state that you work in. It doesn't have to be New York or New Jersey. It can be in any um, state that you would like to be licensed. You are accredited through the National Board Certification of Occupational Therapy. You can work anywhere in the country, okay? So this is one of my favorite quotes. It's a philosophy of occupational therapy um, from Mary Riley, who is one of the godmothers of occupational therapy, if you will. So I'll just read this and really try to think of it. And it really speaks to the picture here of this person. I don't know if it's a man or a woman, but this person um, making a hat and, and working with the straw. Man, through the use of his hands, as they are energized by mind and will, can influence the state of his own health. And so what, that's so beautiful because what it means to me is that think about when you're stressed or when you're bored or when you are trying to process things in your mind. Generally, people will go to do something with their hands, whether it's you know clicking a pen because you're doing like a little bit of a fidget or you're actually going and crocheting. Maybe you're sitting with a group and you're crocheting and you're knitting and you're using your hands. 
So what they're saying is after that, you start to feel better. Your stress level goes down. Your cortisol levels go down. You're able to think more clearly. You're focusing on something with your hands. And so your mind becomes clearer. And that we see time and time again. So occupational therapy, it says man through the use of his hands as energized by his mind and his motivation to do something influences the state of his health. So that's what OT helps other people learn to do. I thought that was just a really beautiful quote to remember. Okay, so as we were talking before, so what makes a great occupational therapy assistant? So we look for people um, who are empathetic. So I, you know, to have sympathy is one thing where you're saying, oh, that's really too bad. I'm so sorry that happened to you. Of course, we all want to be sympathetic. But when you have somebody who is empathetic, that's when you can be able to place yourself in that person's position and say, I understand where you're coming from. I too have had that type of trouble, or I know someone who's had that type of trouble, or I can understand where you're coming from and let's get through it together. And it makes that person not feel so alone. You know, I know as just through my own life experience, um, I was working my previous job, I was working in uh, corporate America. And unfortunately we went through a traumatic event. Obviously the whole world did, the whole nation did specifically with 9-11. And, but I was working in Manhattan and a lot of my company was affected by it very, very sadly. That's a story for a whole other time. And it was traumatic. And so when I would talk to people, speaking with people who also went through this or are able to sit with me and talk with me about what that must have felt like, what I went through, that's showing empathy, not necessarily sympathy where they're saying, poor you. Empathy is sharing. So communicating. Communicating is always important in occupational therapy. Even if you don't become an occupational therapist, let's say you're just working with a loved one who is going through an injury or an illness, and you may need to, um, if they're a hearing person or they're a deaf person, you may need to use nonverbal skills, verbal skills, written communication, um, maybe make the writing bigger if they have low vision issues um, or if they have you know, some type of um, issue going on. I specifically, as my job now, of course, I'm communicating all the time. I'm presenting. I love it. I love educating and I love speaking out to people. But just in the communication area, you need to be able to write documentation to doctors and nurses to talk about what your patient has done for themselves with their um, activities of daily living, their ADLs that we call, you know, if they can feed themselves breakfast or if they can walk to the bathroom. You need to be able to speak to principals and teachers if you're working in a school to talk to the teacher about what your student is able to accomplish. So communication is always important. A leader and a teammate. I need to be able to lead the group that I'm working with. If it's a group of, um, let's say we have a mental health group going on, uh, maybe there's anger management, maybe there's a postpartum group or women's issues or men's issues, or if there's a student group of uh, maybe I have three or four children that all have the same issue. Maybe they all have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or, um, and I wanna kind of keep them so that the, the conversation is flowing and they're able to do role-playing. So I need to be a leader, but I also need to be a teammate and work in interdisciplinary um, areas. So I need to be able to collaborate with about that client with the doctor and the nurse and the psychologist and the social worker and the caseworker and the family member. So I'm part of a team, okay? So that's an area of leader and teammate. Creative problem solver is one of the most important things that we really look for in an occupational therapist or an occupational therapy assistant if you're looking to join the program because there's no better way to put it, but um, forgive the cliche, but you need to be able to build a better mousetrap, so to speak. If someone is not feeling well or someone has a disorder or a disease or they had an injury, let's say somebody had a hip replacement and they may not know how to go pick up their um, eyeglasses that might've fallen on the floor, their sunglasses or their pencil that fell on the floor without breaking their hip precaution, right? The doctor said, do not bend down more than 90 degrees because you will pop out that new hip that we just put in in surgery. So that's where the occupational therapist comes in and tries to figure out with that client, how can we help you be able to do this independently. When I'm not here with you as the OT, how can I help you help yourself? So I may give you a long handled reacher. You know, we've seen all those like, um, I, I don't have one with me now, but it's, but it you, almost looks like uh, a pole where it has like a little trigger on one end and it has a, a pincher grip on the other end and you can put it down on the floor and pick things up off the floor, the paper, or what you need. 
and we have sock aids so that you can help put on your own socks so somebody doesn't have to put your socks on for you. So there's a lot of problem solving that goes on creatively. Flexible and patient. Not everybody works at the pace that you may want them to, need them to, or have time for. And so we always need to remember that flexibility, schedules change, things are kind of flipped up and around. You know, if I'm working in a school, maybe I get to that school and that child's absent. So I have to go to a different school, which is maybe the high school, but maybe I was set up for kindergarten. So I always have to feel like I can, you know, not be so rigid and flexible and be flexible with my schedule. And of course, patient, because you're teaching a client or a patient or a student how to learn on their own to achieve that goal. So we need to be patient and work with them. It may take five or six or 10 or 12 or 15 tries or more. So we're patient with them and detailed and organized. For sure, when I worked in the school, I had 50 or 60 students on my caseload, right? So I have to make sure I know when everybody's meetings are coming up or when everybody's parent asked to speak with me about the progress or you know different things like that. Um, and if I'm working in a hospital as an occupational therapy assistant, I need to make sure I know when that patient is available or when physical therapy has seen them and now I can step in as OT or when speech therapy has come to see them and I can step in. So there's a lot of organization going on. Okay, so where do they work? So I've been talking a little bit, you know, for sure about different places where they work. This lists a lot of them. Again, not even all of them. There's so many places. So I don't want you walking away from this thinking that this is a um, one size fits all career because it's not. Um, you can certainly, the most employable, the, the most employed areas for occupational therapy assistance are for sure in schools um, with autism being diagnosed um, at a much higher rate than it was even 10 years ago or five years ago and skilled nursing facilities, you know, with um, medical science always growing by leaps and bounds, more surgeries are being done, more rehabs are being done. So more patients are going in and then they have to come out and say, well, now how do I get discharged safely to my home? I need someone to come to my home and show me to make sure that I can go to my bathroom myself without falling and hitting my head or remembering to turn off my stove if I, I, I was um, uh, diagnosed with an early form of dementia or Alzheimer's. So these skilled nursing facilities are, are definitely an area where uh, you find a lot of employment with occupational therapy. We also have mental health facilities. I talked about veterans hospitals. Um, there are there are uh, a number of areas um, in uh, I'm trying to think of the name and it, and it escapes me right now. Uh, the hospital, Walter Reed, sorry, the Walter Reed Hospital um, works with uh, veterans and soldiers that have unfortunately been wounded. And you find occupational therapists that get them back. They work with prostheses, um, training, um, how to get back to do what they want to do, whether it's walking or taking their child to school. And now they can walk with these new prosthetic legs that they may have gotten injured um, during. Uh, wartime or being a soldier and being overseas. Pediatric outpatient sensory gyms. We have quite a few here in Rockland and they're really great. That's where um, a parent or a caregiver would take the child after school and go in for a half hour or 45 minute visit and work with that occupational therapy practitioner on helping their child integrate their sensory issues. So they may be hyperactive. They may be hypoactive, which means they're not reacting fast enough. You know, it takes more to kind of get them up and going, or maybe they're they're spinning around and they need to help to kind of bring it down, right? So you might find a dot, lot of different tools there. There's weighted vests, there's swings, there's therapeutic, there's, um, there's running obstacle courses, there's uh, scooter boards, puzzles, all kinds of things, and that's outpatient. Um, there's research. I, I love research. I love working in academia and always finding new things. Um, even prisons, correctional facilities, there's occupational therapists that help inmates to get back into the community. Um, maybe they had issues with substance abuse or they, had, they were convicted of some type of um, situation where they now need to be reintegrated back into the community. And an occupational therapy practitioner might work with them on their rehab to uh, get back to the life that they want to begin again. And then of course, uh, outpatient centers, whether it's ergonomics, which is body posture, or even hippotherapy, which I love, um, that's where you have training uh, a child on a horse 
actually, and they, they do a lot with um, students of autism, students with autism or children with autism or ADHD or um, even some type of um, condition that they were born with, a congenital um, condition they were born with. And the there's a lot to do with a horse with hippotherapy if that's something you're interested in. So certainly a, quite a few areas. Okay, some of the tools that are used. Um, some of the tools that are used in OT sessions, we have, I just have some pictures I'll put up here. We have some pediatric in the sensory gym. There's some of my hip kits that I was talking about. There's your long handled reacher in the middle with the yellow on it, a long handled sponge um, for shower. Here's some splints that, that where an OT would work with a patient that might've had a stroke and it helps with grasp and release. Um, with a stroke, it's called a cerebral vascular accident. You have an attack in the brain, similar to a heart attack, but this is in the brain. And now the brain is not able to tell the muscles what to do anymore. And so these splints retrain the brain um, of how to open your hand and close your hand to grip your own things that you want to do. That is called a goniometer. That's one of the, um, and a dynamometer. Those are some of the tools that we use to see your range of motion and your strength that we would test to see how you're improving. Here we have more splints and we have a scoop plate. We might work with a patient who has dementia or um, uh, Parkinson's. So they're not spilling things again with dignity and independence. They can learn to feed themselves without somebody feeding them. And so there's more of a lip on the dish. So the food doesn't go off the plate and we have built up utensils here. So that's where maybe the person can't grip it as well. They don't have as tight of a grip. Maybe they have arthritis or carpal tunnel or they have um, nerve damage in their hand. So an occupational therapy um, practitioner would work on building up the ends of those utensils so that they can grip them better. Okay. Uh, the dynamometer I have, this is actually one of the things I use in my presentations. I usually show what a dynamometer does that that is where we show the um, pounds of force that a person can squeeze. So that will indicate in, um, in, a, in a quantitative way in numbers, how much pressure you need to open a pickle jar, to open up a doorknob, to grab something. And we can see how strong your hand is and there are certain norms associated with. So that's one of the tools that we use as a dynamometer. So if you're interested, why choose Rockland Community College's OTA program? Well, as I said before in the beginning, the National Board Certification of Occupational Therapy, NBCOT, RCC specifically has an exceptionally high pass rate of our students. Our professors know exactly how to get you through the program so that you can be certified right away through um, this national exam. And then you become a certified occupational therapy assistant. In the past three years, last year we had 100% pass rate of our national exam. The previous year we had 96% pass rate. And the year before that in 2020, in the pandemic year, we had 100% pass rate. So um, rest assured, there are the schools around, you know, shall remain nameless. I'm here to talk to you about RCC, but there are other schools that have an occupational therapy assistant program where they do not have nearly as high of a pass rate for the national exam. The value, of course, of going to a community college such as ours, we have affordable tuition. Um, as I said, our program runs about $12,000, $13,000 for the entire program for the two and a half years. Um, there's also financial aid and scholarships available. So you can contact our financial aid office and they can work with you on that. We have a part-time um, program. It's also, we can be a full-time program. It depends on the amount of credits that you come in with. But like myself, I came in with a bachelor's degree already. And so I only needed my occupational therapy assistant courses. There are 11 of them. And so each class, the great thing about it is that you can still work while you are going to our program because each class is only once a week for a three hour block. So it's not where you have a traditional bachelor's degree program where you might have Monday, Wednesday, Friday for that class. We have currently this semester, our introduction to OT is Mondays from 10 to 1 p.m. And that's it. So you're free to work Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, if that's what you want to do. And we only ask that you are studying devote two hours per one credit. So three hours of class time, up to six hours of study time. Our faculty, as I said, they're dedicated faculty. They all have advanced academic degrees and extensive experience. And within each course, you are going to do community experiences. So our intro to OT course right now, they actually, each student um, takes a wheelchair from our campus 
and they go to a store and they learn what it's like to be in a wheelchair and get through, try on clothes in a fitting room, go to the bathroom, ask for help, because we really can't train people to be empathetic practitioners if you don't know what it's like to be a patient, right? So we really put you in the seat, um, so to speak, of being a patient and understanding what the mindset is and how difficult things might be for somebody who may be suffering or afflicted or going through a, um, a disorder or a process. So our um, program, the applications are open twice a year. We're currently accepting um, applications through June 15th for starting in September. We'd love to see you and love to have you, but we also have a program that starts in January. A lot of programs around um, the OTA programs are once a year. We offer it twice a year. There's a fall start and a spring start. So if you're not ready to start for September, that's okay. You can apply in October, November and start in January. Um, there's information sessions virtually that are run once a month. Our next one is May 10th. I'll actually show you here. I have a, our, our um, I can attach this with Sandra later, but we have 5.30, one Wednesday a month. It's remote. You can do it from your phone or from wherever you are. And we go through the whole application process. Okay. So this is a sample of the courses that you would be taking to train to become an occupational therapy assistant, as I talked about intro to occupational therapy. Clinical conditions is a fascinating course. That's after intro to OT. That's where you learn about all of these diseases and disorders. Again, you can't know how to help somebody with their disorder if you don't know what the disorder is. So that's a course where you learn extensively about um, diabetes. You learn about multiple sclerosis, cystic fibrosis, cancer, brain disorders, strokes, amputations, all kinds, you know, heart attacks, all kinds of things that you need to know in order to now go out into a hospital or a school and work with clients that have those diseases. You have, again, we're, it's not medical school, we're not doctors, but we need to know, have some foundation of what conditions we're working with and speak intelligently to interdisciplinary team member practitioners about that client so we know about those conditions. And then you go on to courses that have um, it's just a geriatrics course, totally devoted to um, elder issues, pediatrics course, where it's from birth to 18 to 21, you learn about all the reflexes and all the developmental stages, a physical disabilities course, and psychosocial dysfunction, which, you know, mental health awareness um, is definitely on the rise, which is a wonderful thing. We're really recognizing more and more about stress and psychological impacts of things. Certainly during COVID, there were a lot more um, people getting in, uh, um, concerned with, there was uh, OCD about germ contamination. Um, there was all kinds of things going on and that impacts our mental health, which impacts how we occupy our time, brings it back to the beginning, how we impact our time. If we're constantly thinking of, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, um, I'm worried about something going on, or I'm depressed, or I'm anxious, or I'm panicking. How will that impact my job? How will that impact how I take care of my children? How will that impact my driving skills if I'm not focused, if I'm thinking about other things? So psychosocial dysfunction is a course that you go through in, the, in this program. And then we move on towards the end on documentation. You need to be able to learn how to write reports for insurance. You need to be able to learn how to write reports for lawyers, for um, directors of rehabilitation, for parents, for insurances, so that it gets paid and not denied by insurance companies. So that's a course that you would learn. And then after all of that, and you've gone through all of these 11 courses, we then send you out, as I talked about before, eight weeks of internship for a pediatric site where you're now supervised by an occupational therapist, uh, occupational therapist, you start off with one patient in the first week and you move on by the eighth week, you have your full caseload where you are supervised and you're really feeling very comfortable. Um, and I, and I, again, I'm speaking from experience because I have done this actual program. So I know what I'm talking about when I say by the end of the eighth week, you're saying, you know what, I got this, I can do this. And it really gives you that confidence to be able to help students in all different capacities. After that eight weeks, you move on to a skilled nursing facility and you do the same thing week one through week eight. We have an academic fieldwork coordinator here on campus and um, she will go through different locations with you. Um, what is going on in that fieldwork? Do you have any questions? And that's the end of the whole program. You graduate, we have a beautiful pinning ceremony. You're now an occupational therapy assistant. You take your national exam 
you will pass as our research has shown and you become certified and you can start working right away and get hired. Um, a lot of times our students get hired from the field works that they're in because they've been there for eight weeks and they've shown their motivation and their competence. So that's always a great plus. So how do I learn about RCC's OTA program? Um, you can go to our website. That is um, our occupational therapy, sunyrockland.edu slash program slash occupational dash therapy. And if I have time, I'll go um, back and we can I can show you what the uh, website looks like. But on there, you will see frequently asked questions. You will go through um, what an occupational therapist uh, and assistant, what they do. Um, you'll go through statistics of all of our exams. Um, you know, uh, our, our costs are on there, all kinds of anything you needed to know about occupational therapy. And then of course you can apply for our program on there. There's a red button to easily apply on our online application, as well as sign up for an info session, those once a month info sessions that I talked about. Um, here is a YouTube. Again, I will see if I can um, get to that in just a minute. I wanna go through um, the rest of my presentation so we don't run out of time. and I. We'll just make sure that we cover everything. This is also one of my favorite quotes, and I saw this out there. This is from the American Occupational Therapy Assistant, uh, Association President, um, Ginny Stoffel. So she says, occupational therapy practitioners ask, what matters to you? Not what's the matter with you? I'm not concerned. Of course, I, not, I'm not going to say not concerned. Of course, not to say not concerned. I am not diagnosing you. I am not treating your condition or your injury, but I am really empathetic and really trying to problem solve what matters to you, despite what you're working with, what your journey has been so far. So if you want to play tennis, but you had a ganglion cyst on your hand, which again, you'll, you'll learn all about this in OT school, um, and you can no longer grip the um, tennis racket, well, then I will work with you on strengthening exercises or different things that you need to work on with your hands so that you can go back and play tennis and doubles and go back competitively play tennis if that's what you wanted to do. So it's all about what matters to you. That's what we always are thinking about. Our um, So here again is our website for occupational therapy. And when you're on there, there's a red tab that says upcoming OTA info session. And our next one will be May 10th. I just had one uh, last night, as a matter of fact. And we had quite a few um, prospective students that were on there to find out our information. We have very small classes. We take up to about 20 people per semester that we accept. And our classes are small, which is a great thing because it's an on-hand, in-person program. We're learning to be therapy practitioners. So when we have six to eight to 10 students in a class, we all get to know each other. We all become that one cohort. And from 101, you move on to 102 together. And then you move on to 103 and 105 and so on. And by the time you're in this program, you really know the students that are in your group. And so there's a lot of conversation back and forth. There's discussion boards. Um, you know, So there's room for study groups. So it's great to have that small hands-on group. And as I said, our online applications are being accepted through June 15th. So our QR code is there. If you'd like to take a picture of it, it goes right to our um, occupational therapy website. And um, yeah, that's okay. So that's that. Uh, okay. So I was going to say to Sandra, if anyone has any questions, certainly I can I can uh, open up to any questions. And I have uh, videos there. If we, I don't know if we have time. It's a two minute video, but maybe we should talk about questions first, if there are any. Yeah, let's let's do some questions. I don't have anyone. Uh, asking questions right now, but I'll be happy if uh, people ask questions. I do have a question. What What is the enrollment process? Do you need like different uh, recommendation letters? Do Do you need to finish college first? Like, yeah, what okay. will be the requirements to apply? Great question. Thank you so much for asking that. And that's what I go over in my info session. So <laughs> that I will show you. We have, um, we're very lucky actually, because in the time of the dinosaur when I did this um, 12 years ago, it was a paper application. Now it is, this is a cop, this is a hard copy, but it's an online application. So it's all a Google form. It's very easy. Um, you do need two letters of recommendation. So if you're thinking of applying, I encourage people to 
start thinking of people that can talk about you in a capacity of your work ethic, your um, how conscientious you are, how diligent you are, why they think you would make a great occupational therapy assistant or great in this field, um, what how long they've known you. So we don't want family members, because of course every, everyone's family loves everyone, but we really want someone on the outside for references. So start thinking about that. Um, then there's videos that we also have in our application process. So when you go through the online application, you'll get to a page that shows you eight different YouTubes. And in those YouTubes, they've been vetted for different areas of occupational therapy. So we have a video that talks about stroke. They have a video that talks about mental health. We have a video that talks about pediatrics or autism. Um, and you go through all of those videos and you really get an idea. In the application, you're asked to pick a few of those videos that you've seen and then talk about them in your application and what you have pulled out of it and what you think, why it's so great for OT, what, you know, what, what, um, what spoke to you about that. So as far as eligibility, so you need to be a um, current student of RCC or apply to RCC in order to apply to our program. We have a separate program from RCC. So obviously um, to get to RCC, you need to have a high school diploma, or a GED, um, general education diploma. So if a general equivalency diploma. So if you have a high school or GED, you can apply to RCC, you talk to the admissions department. Once that happens, then you can apply to our OTA program, okay? Um, we certainly encourage anybody right after high school through, I have students in the courses now, one is 18 and I have one that is 60. So any age, um, somebody just asked me this the other day, what's the general age? And honestly, I came to this program, again, as a 40-year-old mom. So um, I wasn't alone, but there were students that were in their 20s. There were students that were in their 50s. So really, it's whenever it speaks to you. It's such a short program, and it's so great to be able to do it and to go out there and start working that we have a lot of second career um, students, and we have a lot of first-time career students. And as I said, does it make it easier to enroll if you, for example, have taken some nursing classes or some other healthcare uh, classes? Yes, um, also a great question. So in addition to our 11 courses that you need to take for occupational therapy, all of those courses that I showed you in that sample, we also need you to take anatomy and physiology one and two, okay? And the reason being is of course, we talked about learning the clinical conditions, but you also need to be able to speak to a patient or a, or a client mm -hmm. about the inner workings of their shoulder or their fingers, right? Or their, um, or their, you know, their, their core, their scapula, their neck, their, you know, what's going on. So we learn all about the, um, the body. So it's not a prerequisite necessarily for anatomy and physiology one in order to apply. If you have already taken it, we just ask that it's within the last five years because we want to make sure you're able to recall it and remember it. Obviously, the skeleton doesn't change, but we want to make sure that you're you know, pretty adept at remembering. If you haven't taken it yet, that's okay. You can take anatomy and physiology one with your occupational therapy one course in that first semester. The other two things that I need to mention is developmental psychology and abnormal psychology are requirements. You can take them during the time that you're taking your OT program, not necessarily a prerequisite either. If you've taken them, great, but you do need to take them either before or during the course because we need to learn the, the um, milestones from zero to life end stages of where a person is psychologically. And then of course, abnormal psychology, you want to see where it goes awry and dealing with patients that have kind of gone off the normal sequence of developmental. And then, um, English 101 and 102, we need to make sure that you can sit for, um, be placed in an English college English writing course, because there's a lot of writing, there's research, there's papers and there's presentations and understanding journal articles and things like that. So that's what you have. So you have English 101 and 102, you have developmental psych and abnormal psych, and you have abnormal, um, uh, sorry, you have anatomy and physiology one and two. Those are the six courses that are not specifically core OT courses, they're in addition to our 11 OT courses. Thank you for clarifying that, Stacey. And I think we're running out of time, believe it or not. Like an hour can fly when you're having fun, doesn't it? Yes. So I want to thank you for being thank with you. us. I'm sure that you're going to come back and talk to us more about occupational therapy and maybe in another uh, 
community chats, we can talk about like different cases and how people have helped other people, right? Uh, I think that's going to be interesting for people to learn about. But I want to thank you for being here and again for reaching out to us to help you promote occupational therapy. We know it's a beautiful career. Obviously, we have some occupational therapists in our Monsignor Mayan Hospital. Sure. And they do all great job. They're great people. So, thank you know, you so all of you do amazing. So thank you so much. And thank you to everybody in our audience for being here today. And I can't wait to see you again next week at 12 p.m. in our next community chat. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Take care.